Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, you know, here in beautiful paradise, there's a beautiful breed of people who are out there watching out for our interests. They're watchdogs. And one of my favorite is a consumer and environmental watchdog, somebody who's taken a hobby and turned it into a profession. He's out there watching out for consumers, making sure that we don't get bilked or we pay too much. He's also watching out for Mother Nature, the environment, because we don't want to pollute Mother Nature as well. He's also a dear friend of mine and one of the most interesting characters we've had on our program. And today we're going to feature Carol Cox, environmental watchdog. I think you're going to find quite interesting some of the stories he's got to tell. One of them has to do with, well, why you should actually read and monitor your water meter. I'll let him tell us a little more. Carol, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you. Steve. Well, it's always good to have you on board here. Have you been keeping Keeping safe? I'm keeping safe, but you know, just once in a while you have to use your head. Oh, that's right, and you've used your head in a way that is not all that convenient nor safe in your investigations. Yeah. You've also been attracting a few fireworks from time to time. Yeah, uh, pre-Christmas fireworks, pre-New Year's fireworks. Well, well, I'm just going to give a note to our viewers <laughs> here. If you take a look at some past programs, you'll learn how Carol's own investigations into some of the hanky-panky going on in state agencies, government agencies and in the commercial world has resulted in him getting beat up, knocked on the head, put into the hospital, and even having his car firebombed. And that's just a day's work. Right, it's <laughs> an incentive. So Motive. let me ask you, how do you describe yourself? I know for purposes of this program, we said environmental watchdog, but what is Carol Cox Incorporated? Basically, uh, Carol Cox is just another human being who cares about right and wrong, justice, environmental justice, fighting environmental racism, and there's such a thing. And well, I'm going to pause you right here because that sounds intriguing. What is environmental racism? When disproportionately uh, landfills, garbage dumps, industry, industrial sites, and waste sites and treatment sites, what have you, are placed or situated in communities of low-income people of color. And, and also, that is the other aspect of what I do, looking for the impacts on people, period, but mostly focusing on the, those that are unfortunate be not well off. So you're saying we don't live in a society full of fairness all the time. We have a disparate impact in terms of certain minority groups that are overly represented amongst those who are the victims of environmental hazards. Well, they're, in all communities, they are impacted. Even, uh, for example, I'm working with a group on uh, Kauai now, and we're talking about millions of dollars in homes, five, six million dollars, and I'm working with them to prevent a dairy, hoping to prevent a dairy being sited uphill, upslope, in an area that would impact those properties, that community, and the coastal zone, coastal areas. So everybody has everybody. to watch out, everybody. including the United States Air Force, isn't that right? <laughs> yes. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. You know, one of the things that environmental and consumer watchdogs do is look out for the consumer. And usually we're thinking of the consumer as the little guy, the guy who goes to the store and buys a product, or someone who buys a car and it gets blown up or something like that but but even the United States Air Force represents American consumers right because we're the taxpayers who support it so what's going on with the Air Force well you know that the, the Air Force and like many military agencies are, have lots of money sure. big budget and if, and if they're not mindful of it it could be intentionally wasted or other people providing services and in this instance the border water supply the honolulu border water supply actually overbill the air force for some extended period of time upwards of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's what they're reporting our initial report that we received from internal sources that it was upwards of fifty million now oh, now wait a minute y you've got a variance of possibly over billing the Air Force by 350000 at the low end, mm -hmm. but at the high end, what did you say? $50 million. That 50 was million. the original information is that, that we right? received now. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle, but hidden behind closed doors. Well, now let me back up a little bit so our viewers know what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a beautiful part of the island of Oahu, Bellows Air Force Station, which is on the northern part, really, and uh, 
there's an Air Force station there that has housing, it has military facilities, it has training facilities. It needs water, right? It needs water. So it gets the water from the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. Right. But like all consumers, it doesn't necessarily read its own meter, so mm -hmm. time lag takes place and it discovers maybe they were overcharged. Now, tell me the story here. Uh, how did they discover that they were overcharged by the Board of Water? Well, I want to be very careful All and, right. and, and, and laying out the facts as I know them to be as I got involved. That's Initially, right. I was told from internal sources, people that worked there that participated in meetings, that there was a discussion of $50 million of overcharge. People who worked where? Worked in Board of Water Supply. Okay. Now, Moving forward, we get that information. That seems like a unreal or almost an impossible amount of money. So with That's caution, right. we then write a letter to the Board of Water Supply asking, is there any truth to this, this amount? Is there any truth to the overcharging? Well, they wrote us back reluctantly and said, yes, there is an overcharge, but the amount is substantially less than 50 million. Now, how do you communicate such a thing? Why wouldn't you just tell us specifically what it is? Then we also wanted to know the cause. And then when did it start? Well, to date, I'm still waiting on the documents that we waited for, and we waited two weeks with promises that we would get an answer tomorrow, for example. Now, you've not just called them up and asked them and left a message at the reception or on the uh, voice m machine. You've actually gone through a process backed by a federal law, the right. Uniform Information Act. Uniform Information Practices, Practices Act, Act. And, and also FOIA, Freedom of Information Freedom of Act. Information Act. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's the federal law. Right. And it says that a citizen can actually obtain the information that is publicly available to citizens. Yes. A little bit redundant. It, it assumes that government doesn't make it readily available, but you went through that process. And to this date, you haven't been given the actual amount. Well, we've given uh, an estimate. The an Air estimate. Force said it's 350000 approximately. Then the city said it's 358000 Okay, how close do you think those figures are to the truth? Well, I'm unhappy with any of the answers because and how close to the truth, I think we're still far off because there is one little uh, thing here of interest that might find quite interesting and that is situated next to bellows is a city park oh, okay which receives waters from the same source okay so in actuality the city basically was consuming water as we understand and then in turn it is a suspect in being some of the consumption that was metered and the government the federal government paid for that that is still out. The jury is still out looking at it. So when you ask what are the answers and how close it is, they've not been transparent. And you have to know now that the, the Department of Board of Water Supply is not transparent. It's one of those very secret semi-autonomous situations or agencies. And so it makes it so difficult to obtain information. And so my policy is I'll get the information, I'll inquire of you, but I will still share with the public what we, in the raw form, what we are told. That then gives the public an opportunity to see, are they being transparent? Are they being honest? Can I save 350000 I really can't say because there's so many variables involved here and so many elements of concern that they're not disclosing. Now, you've been at this practice for a long time, trying to dig deeper. You, you, you know that where there's smoke, there's fire, but you're not claiming that there's a fire right now. You're just saying that if it's supposed to be open and known to the public so that we can check it out, the problem itself is it's not open and known to the public, and we can't check it out. Right, and, and you raised a good point earlier. It's, they're not, we're not asking the secrets where they keep the nuclear weapons. This is just a water bill. That's right. And, and so why wouldn't they be so happy to be transparent from the first receipt of my letter or inquiry? Be timely. Well, that's where your knowledge of human nature comes in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're, we're not being watched. Yeah. Things happen. Yeah, and, and, and keep in mind now, we, we say the Air Force, but it actually is a taxpayer. And then as you 
couple of years have gone by now where this board of water supply has been overcharging people because they were not using meters as they claim they were and with accuracy they were estimating bills so in other words you use 5,000 gallons this year this week uh, this month uh, this billing period at your home they come back next month and say well we'll just estimate the amount so you could go double that amount or less than that amount but most of the time many people got high water bills so when we heard about this we thought this matter had been fixed we thought that as they promised they would have fixed it they didn't fix it you know as you've looked into institutions particularly government institutions is there a sense that well it's it's not my water i'm not paying for this water so that the managers don't actually pay as close attention as they sh would if it were their own costs involved and we find that to be true in some instances but this situation is unique it's so convoluted and it is as if we're dealing with two enemies with the, the Board of Water Supply and the Air Force it was not timely and, and the answers they gave you, you would think uh, it wasn't thank you for raising this issue with us we're glad that the public is uh, watching out or got our back so to speak none of that just a very nonchalantly uh, give us something just to keep the dog quiet like the hush puppy at the back door. So, Carol, they're not sending you a Valentine greeting this no, year. No, I never get those. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of resistance do you often encounter from agencies? Delays uh, in, in information. Uh, it's like you get caught in the quagmire. You, you write a request, and then the, the state law, by the way, say that all you have to do to make a formal request it could be verbal for UIPA for documents verbal now sure but this agency like many now will say well, you need to fill out the form but the law states you don't need to fill out a form you it is considered formal when you make that request okay well at least we're gonna keep tracking what, what, what you you have discovered here at Bellows it right. looks like there might be something going wrong but nobody can tell when we come back from a quick break we're gonna talk with Carol about something that we already know is wrong that is hurting people and hurting the environment and uh, learn a little bit more about investigating and bringing about good uh, my guest today is Carol Cox an environmental watchdog here in Hawaii I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute you're watching Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako will be right back after this short break. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kawilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's Okay, I'm here with Brent Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brent, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay? Deal? Uh, that's the deal. Brett Obergott, <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome back from that break. We're on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako here every week, Monday at 2 o'clock p.m., but broadcast across the world and constantly available online at thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see about, oh, maybe 30 to 35 other hours of original content emanating from Honolulu, produced by Think Tech Hawaii. Great people, Jay Fidel and company, wonderful staff. They're doing a real public service, broadcasting on everything from science and technology to politics and government, to the arts, to cooking, you name it, they've got it on Think Tech Hawaii. And that's why we like them at the Grassroot Institute, where we say, e hana kako, let's work together, because think of the terrible alternative if we don't work together. Well, you know, there's somebody who's working for the benefit of consumers and all citizens of Hawaii, and he is loved and beloved by consumers, but not always by people he's keeping a watch on, and that's Carol Cox. Carol, you know, uh, here in Hawaii, we're absolutely dependent upon our power energy plants. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows the, the big name, Hawaiian Electric Company, or Hawaii Electric if you're on the big island, the, the big companies. But 
what we may not realize is that, is that there are smaller companies that, that feed fuel into the big grid system to the HECO, and one of those happens to be AEG Cogeneration. Tell us a little bit about that company, just by way of background. Well, AES. AES, excuse right. me, AES Cogeneration. Is, is one of many companies that provide, or entities that provide energy to HECO in fact, Hawaiian the, Electric. all these other entities actually add up to quite a bit of HECO's power supply, at least half, or almost half. And there's another one near AES out there called Kalilo Partners. We're talking about the Campbell Industrial yes. Area. Is yes, that right? that's where AES is situated, Campbell Industrial Park. Now, it's in close proximity to the H-Power burning facilities owned by the city, operated by Covanta and Honolulu All Resource right. Disposal. Well, w what happens at AES? Well, AES imports coal. Okay, it's coal-based. Yes, and, and, and then in turn, it's brought in at the Deep Draft Harbor there in Kala, in Barbers Point. All right. And by tr trellis, air trellis, it's truck trailered into the site and dumped on a, a conveyor belt. Okay. And that then is just open coal, and it's mountainous. So, so open coal is just being transported from the shoreline. From the inland. shoreline by conveyor belt. Okay, when you say mountainous, you mean it's it mountain, comes of, of two mountains of coal. Uh, maybe they. I think it's described as 185 feet in some places. Okay. And and so, but uh, they also burn tires. Tires. Filters waste oil of some types and maybe some other products. That and these are burnt? In the, they're burnt. With the fumes going out into the air? Yes, the, the unburned product, byproduct mm -hmm. of those. And then it also generates an ash. So we have two issues here. Fluidized bed coal ash. All right. F resulting from the burning of the coal. FBCA. Fluidized bed coal ash. Yes. They burn the coal and this ash rises. Well, some of it rises and, and they're supposed to have a scrubbers in their uh -huh. facility. But the problem is once they burn that coal and the other materials, it leaves a large amount tonnage of ash. All right. And so the problem there is not only are you having the coal in itself in natural pure form, you also have the ash now that is laying open to the elements. All right. And the wind is blowing, uh, the way the state has allowed them. They have a solid waste permit, but the state is just unbelievably anemic in it as its enforcement effort and regulatory body of efforts on this. Now, what is the harm of, of, of this ash when it comes to humans actually breathing in the air in, in the vicinity? Well, a, a number of uh, heavy metals that are concerned, lead, chromium, uh, but one, arsenic is associated arsenic? with arsenic. In fact, m some of our viewers may actually have passed by this area. We've got mm -hmm. some photos that we'll put up for, and so, so we can actually get a, a look at it, like over here, Carol, if you take a look. This is what you're talking about, the AES cogeneration plant. Arsenic, you say? Arsenic, and there are a number of heavy metals of concern. There's eight heavy metals of concern so associated with that, but other things, because we really don't know what they are actually burning, you see, the constituents contained in those things. Whatever is associated with tires, for example, also become a problem. And waste oil, what type of waste oil are they burning? Well, what kind of assurances does the public have right now that the air is safe enough to, to breathe in, the, in that region? We, we've got several bedroom communities out there in, in the Kapole area all the way through Nanakuli. Well, this area is situated, this facility is situated close to the ocean, number one, uh -huh. which is of great concern. There are businesses, and, and mind you now, uh, it's hard to imagine, but there are businesses where the coal and the coal ash is drifting off-site, and you'll find it in one to two inches thick in other businesses unassociated with that facility. And the state enforces, and, and part of their solid waste permit, you cannot have any fugitive dust, meaning your work cannot generate dust and drift over, over the boundaries. Well, what is the danger of it being so close to the ocean? What, what does that do with well, the transmittal of that dust? Well, concerns that with it, it contaminates those constituents, okay. those heavy metals are washed down the drain or by air or what have you. In our case, what we found is that there's a heavy deposit of these ash 
of materials and coal dust just littering the grounds now, saturating the, in areas. Many areas are just completely covered. You rake back and you won't see the natural earth anymore. You'll see an inch or two of coal, depending on the, the wind influence. Now, how did you learn about this or get involved in, in investigating? Well, for years, uh, because this site, knowing its impacts and the potential mm -hmm. impacts and of concern and knowing how uh, loosely operating the state is when it comes to the enforcement, we believe that we need to keep watching it as, as I say, a watchdog, because we don't believe that the state is actively, uh, they will give a permit like here with conditions that rips can't be in the fencing. You can't have the coal drifting off site. Well, if you go there now by flying a drone, we are able to document that coal is drifting off site, the fence is towing and the dust is blowing and you can see it daily. Now, you've looked at the regulations that this plant must comply with, and, and you're suggesting that there are many areas in which it's not in compliance. So you're taking some action now, aren't you? You're, yeah. you're working with the regulatory body to bring this to light. What are you doing? Well, I'm reluctantly, and, and with, with not much uh, excitement about it, because I'm going to an agency that already issues a permit and has conditions of a permit, and then they sit on their thumbs and do nothing. So, so you're, you're <laughs> going to the fox for help in watching the hen house. Right, and, and then I'm also having to consult with the wolf also on this, you know, it's just about like that, and, and you, it's so obvious. So for example, I file a formal complaint against this facility with the state health department. I went out at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, you see this activity at nighttime as well, and the dust bellowing. When I say dust, I use that loosely, the coal ash or the, the coal dust blowing away because they were using instrument uh, in, in, in equipment, heavy equipment, bulldozers and what have you, to break it up. Now, this coal ash, when it's dumped out, it's kind of loose and moist, but it creates a cake coating on the top, it hardens. So now they gotta go back and take a backhoe or a claw, break it up, then put it on the truck and ship it out. That generates the dust, depending on which way the wind's blowing. So this dust is not merely around the area, it's wherever the trucks are going, and it, it just travels. Right, and, and this dust, this coal ash now, some they claim go to uh, Waimanala Gulch landfill, mm -hmm. some go to uh, PVT landfill. PVT landfill is uh, using some of it, as they describe it, as fire breaks. But again, it's generating more than they can actually get rid of. And so the state is rather uh, reluctantly enforcing anything. And so when we go to them and file the complaint, provide the pictures that you're seeing here, they have these pictures. And they want to know where we were standing, uh, how long were we standing there, who took the pictures, what, you know, how did we get such angle? So they want to investigate you more than the problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and then the, the final uh, remarks are, well, you know, unless we can show that these particles of dust that you find here off the property came from there, there's nothing we can do. They're not going to go in and start looking based upon what you've discovered preliminarily? Well, they are because we're going to because be you push them hoping to, do it. to file legal action in this particular one because it's substantial. The impacts are so great and so, so, of such concern that we're going to take this one to the next level in, in this occasion. Well, if there are any people who have anything to contribute to your case here, how would they get a hold of you? Contact us at carolcox.com or carol at carolcox. Dot com and we want to make email. sure that we get your spell, uh, spelling right, carolcox.com, C-A-R-R-O-L-L. -L. -L -L. Two R's and two L's right. and then C-O-X. Two it. Well, that's important. You, before we leave today, I'm sure you'd like to hear from our viewers or the public uh, if they have concerns about the environment or some consumer situations. What are the types of things you're looking forward to helping them look into? Things that have impacts on the environment impacts on communities in a big way, not, not a dispute between neighbors. We, there's so many of those, you know. <laughs> that's where you go, I can help you and guide you to what agencies you contact. But we're looking at the bigger um, ones that impact 
communities commu and impact big portions of the environment itself, the ocean, land, and what have you. So that's what we'd like to focus on because there's many a little fires occurring out there. You know, at this, in this region of Kapolei with this power plant, have there been any reports yet of health problems with children or elderly or anyone at all or people who may have uh, respiratory well, conditions? This is rather loosely uh, stated and, and that some of the surrounding businesses, the people that work there, speak of uh, congestion, coughs that they didn't have before and those that are seeing the dust in their business. Uh, that is it's in migrating inside of the buildings and what have you. Nothing to do with AES, just the dust and what have you. So they're concerned. But I might add now, some might argue, there's a cement plant also located in the area, but there's a difference, and it, it can be told a difference. But they, they AES in the states as well, the allowment, allowance for contents and the levels are legal and safe. Yeah, but they are supposed to keep them on their side of the fence and so, not running down the street into the drain into the ocean. That's something, isn't it? And uh, did you, you have people reach out to you and say, look into this? Uh, yes. Ninety-five percent of the information that we get on any matter starts with honest people and that's the good thing. It's a misunderstanding, and it is not accurate to say government workers are not honest. They are honest. It's just that they fear the sword. They could be beheaded if they're caught talking to and telling the truth. So our informants come to us with uh, anonymity, and we do that f to protect them, but also to safeguard our sources in further cases That's right. that develop. Well, Carol, you're doing a great job, and keep us informed and come back and visit us and tell Alrighty. us more of what's Thank taking you. place. My guest today is Carol Cox, Hawaii's premier environmental watchdog who really puts his neck on the line uh, and his head into his business qu quite a bit. And uh, I hope you enjoyed and learned something from today's program. I'm Kili Akina with the Grassroot Institute, and we're signing off for Ehana Kako. Let's work together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next time, aloha.